Good afternoon and welcome to this online and interactive session called Why the Danish Crave Organic Foods and the Dutch Not Yet, part of the Bio Kennis Week 2021. My name is Helen Kranstauber. I am the co-founder of Food Cabinet, a campaigning agency, and I will be moderating the next session during 30 to 45 minutes. And this session is all about our central question how to reach a 25% market share of organic foods in the Netherlands by 2030. Because it was this ambitious goal that was set by the European Union last year as part of the farm to fork strategy. And with only nine years ahead, this seems like a very long way to go still. So today we turn to the case of Denmark, a very inspiring country when it comes to organic food, because in the last years they successfully gained a market share of 12%. And they are now the world's front leaders when it comes to organic food. So we, of course, want to know how they did this. So we talk today with Paul Holmbeck. He is the former director of Organic Denmark. And in the studio we have our guest, Cheert de Groot, member of Parliament for the Democrats and responsible for food and agriculture. And of course, there is you, our participants at home. You can interact with this session and bring in your ideas. But first, we want to know why the Dutch not yet crave organic food. So we have a look at a short video in which Dutch consumers tell us what their motivations are but also their barriers to buy more organic. Let's have a look. Meer aanbod in meerdere supermarkten, denk ik. Het is helemaal niet duidelijk wat nu wel biologisch is en wat niet. Well, I mean the price itself, I, I can afford it. It's not accessible to everybody, I think. Alleen als het in de aanbieding is, misschien wel door gewoon subsidie van de overheid. Ik denk dat dat echt bij de persoon zelf gaat om wat wil ik voor mijn eigen lichaam doen. Dat is ook de reden waarom ik biologisch eet en waarom ik ook vegan eet. Omdat ik gewoon weet dat voor mijn eigen lichaam het toch wel de beste keuze is. Dus ja, het hangt toch echt van de persoon zelf af wat zij, uh, wat zij willen bereiken met hun dieet. Ik ga dan ook zelf niet naar een biologische supermarkt, omdat die bij mij totaal niet in de buurt zit. Voor de prijs wie je betaalt, heel duur. En ik vraag me dan echt af of het allemaal wel biologisch is. Ik ben er helemaal niet bewust mee bezig, biologisch. Ik denk dat je wel echt specifiek bijvoorbeeld naar een markt moet gaan of ja, echt naar een bio-winkel om echt goed bio-vlees of kip of dingen te halen. Ik vind in de Albert Heijn bijvoorbeeld best wel ja, niet echt per se een heel ruim aanbod op bepaalde producten. En dus eigenlijk de regering en dergelijke daar meer ja, druk op zetten eigenlijk, zodat alles bio is. Ik denk wel echt dat het prijsverschil best wel belangrijk is. Dus dat het niet al te, te duur wordt, omdat ik gewoon niet zoveel centjes heb. Als dat ook nog zou kunnen, dan uh, zou ik uh, wel vaker biologisch kiezen, denk ik. Want ik heb gehoord van na de 50 plus, dan moet je een beetje biologisch ook gaan denken voor je gezondheid. Yeah, we also want to hear your ideas and you can interact with this session and my co-host Kevin Corcoran will now tell you how to do this. Yes, thanks Helen. Um, so let me explain how it's going to work. We're going to use the wisdom and creativity of the crowd, that's, that's you guys at home, uh, and everyone can participate uh, digitally in these upcoming 30 minutes. And the main question for this brainstorm is, what actions should we undertake to get the Dutch consumers craving for organic? And with we, we mean the government, uh, campaigns towards consumers, and what can retail and businesses do? So please share with us uh, your great ideas, your thoughts, examples, or proven strategies. Share your answer to the main brainstorm uh, question, and share your input. Uh, please do it via the, the chat function in your, uh, in your browser. It's on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'll be uh, checking all the comments and I'll add them to a digital canvas. Um, so later on during this workshop, we can discuss your input um, and, and talk about the, the solutions. So to kickstart the creativity, we'll go on a trip around the world. So I've got three examples for you that caught our attention. The first example is from Brazil. The government came up with 10 rules for good and healthy eating. 
I'll share with you the top three uh, golden rules from Brazil. And I've got some other smaller rules that are really, really beautiful and social. So rule number one, make good foods, uh, make foods and freshly uh, prepared dishes and meals the basis of your diet. Number two is be sure oils, fats, sugars and salt are used in moderation in culinary preparations and limit the intake of ready to consume products and avoid those that are ultra processed. And we've got some other small rules we really love is, um, for example, eat in company whenever possible, share your skills, plan your time for eating and be critical of the commercial advertisements of food products. The second example is ugly delicious. It's a great example from France. Intermarché made a very unusual choice to start promoting fruit and veg that would never make it to the stores. The inglorious fruit and veg. It's a campaign against food waste with great results, building on sympathy and helping consumers pick veg and fruit what would normally be left behind. So no fruit and veg were wasted in this campaign. The last one is an example from our own country. And if you can beat them, you better join them. Well, rather don't join them, better beating them in their advertising methods. This one is the first, uh, first campaign um, where we promote one kind of vegetable. That's the broccoli. The campaign is called Big Bang Broccoli and it aired in 2015. So three great examples we would love to share with you. And now it's up to you to participate in our brainstorm. So keep the ideas coming in and I'll add them to our digital screen and we can talk about ideas later on. Thank you, Kevin. So keep the ideas coming and we will check in with Kevin every couple of minutes or so. So in a minute, we will go to our first guest and it's Paul Holmbeck. He will be joining us from Denmark. He is an independent eco consultant and he is the former director of Organic Denmark. It is the organization that represents consumers, businesses, farmers and food professionals all over Denmark. And over the last 25 years, they had done some remarkable work on pushing the organic market forward to this now astonishing 12% market share. Paul had a remarkable job and a leading role in unifying the organic movement. And today he will share his lessons and his advice with us on what we can do in the Netherlands and what we can learn from Denmark. Because Denmark is now the most pro-organic consumer or the most pro-organic country in the whole world. That's something to be really proud of. So before we will talk to Paul, let's have a closer look into the Danish case. Welcome to the studio. Welcome to this session. We're happy to have you. Thank you. Happy to be here. First, I want to congratulate you on all your accomplishments in the last years in Denmark. You did a fantastic job. So Thank you on behalf of everyone that made that happen. Yes, we're going to talk about our central question. We want to make the organic market grow. Uh, there's an ambitious goal set by the European Union. 25% in 2030. Uh, that's quite ambitious, so we can use all your lessons learned in, in Denmark. 
so let's start. Um, we saw in the short video that 80% of consumers in Denmark, they actually buy organic foods. Uh, it's a really big market. How did you build such a strong consumer trust in your country? Yeah, well, part of it is just strong messaging about everything that organics has to offer, strong and clear messaging about the benefits for nature, for health, for animal welfare. Um, I think that the, uh, the organic label is also extremely important. We have um, eight out of 10 have trust or high trust to the label. And organics has also become kind of a one-stop shopping for a whole range of sustainability issues where people just want things to go faster. Um, and then we also find that there's a really high level of trust in the organic farmers and producers themselves. Um, and that's built up over a number of years where, you know, they, the, the values that they've been talking and the practices that they've been doing, they've really been walking the talk and that's given a huge credibility. So there's just this level of trust. Organic farmers are really going to try to do the right thing, yeah. even if they haven't solved all the problems in yeah. the world. What are the main motivations of people in Denmark to actually buy organic foods? We just you know, saw the video. Uh, there are quite some barriers also for people to choose organic. But what are the main motivations for the Danish? Yeah, the, big, the big three are, are health, uh, environment, and, uh, and animal welfare. Yes. And that's also the, where the campaign is built upon. It's the messaging you just shared with us. Is it built on these three pillars? Yeah, it is. And, you know, the different campaigns have, have a different focus, have different focus. You know, sometimes we're going towards animal welfare. Other times it's health and, you know, what you're putting in your kids' mouths. Um, and we also try to go beyond information about these things also and bring people out on the farms. We put a lot of emphasis on people actually experiencing organics. So we have two major events we have where we have together more than 5% of the population out on organic farms every year. And that'd be for the Netherlands, that'd be like almost a million people out on organic farms on a given day. So it's, um, and that makes a real impression on people. It sticks with them more than just kind of information. Yeah really make them experience what organic farming is, is all about. And you mentioned the different, la different label. So you have your own label in Denmark um, to, uh, to show what products are organic. Um, what is the role that label plays in, you said, consumer trust, but it makes it also really clear for people if they want to choose organic, what products they, they can pick from the supermarket. Yeah, it's been it, it, having our, our red organic label as one label and not a variety of organic labels has been an enormous strength, enormous strength, both for our communication, just makes it easier for everyone, really, producers and consumers to kind of find their way along the path or up the stairs of, uh, of organics. Um, and it also has had that benefit because it is a national label that it's increased the engagement from the public sector it's actually owned by the public sector. Most of the uh, campaigns and so on have been driven by Organic Denmark, the, the, the organic movements organization. But, but it, since it's owned and the inspection, the rules, um, the enforcement, all of that is done, that's a level of an engagement that's increased investments from also from the public sector in their own label. Yeah. So that's been an important role also. Yeah. Are there any, you just mentioned that, the, the campaigning uh, activities. I mean, are there any lessons learned from Denmark that we can learn from in the Netherlands uh, about campaigning strategies that you mm -hmm. used uh, also to reach out to maybe a broader public? Because here in the Netherlands, the market share for organic foods, it's, it's still really small. Um, and have reached out to, I think, a, a small group of, uh, of the population. I mean, what are some of the campaigning strategies you used to reach out to a broad audience? Right. Well, I think, I mean, one of the critical things with campaigns is that you have a campaign platform. And so by having very close relationships with all the retail uh, leaders, we've been able to involve both at food companies, but also the retail leaders in bringing these messages out to people in store, outdoor, um, on TV. So it's, um, it's been that kind of uh, 
you know, network based communication, but also broad participation in these campaigns. So that's that's one thing. And we've also done positive message, messaging. Uh, we don't talk about conventional farming. We don't talk about conventional farmers. And that positive messaging really seems to resonate. Um, we also try to have some fun. Um, we have had campaigns for four reasons for organic that even men can understand because we found this teasing factor where uh, women who bought, were doing most of the shopping and all, definitely most of the organic shopping, when they got home with the products, they were having being teased about the price or, you know, what's the real difference, et cetera. So we need to have some uh, quick arguments you can use with your husband or your boyfriend. And then we armed the kids too with um, questions they could ask dad about, you know, how does organics protect our drinking water quality? And they had water balloons for dads that gave the wrong answers. So those kind of things. Um, I think some of the other campaigns, a lot of them are word plays in Danish, but we had one is called in Himmel to Forskel, uh, which is, uh, it's like a, a heavenly difference, which literally it's all about animal welfare. It's about that the organic animals can actually see the sky. Uh, and, and so, but it's like a heaven, a, a, di a different heaven kind of, kind of yeah. thing. So, yeah. So positivity, humor, I mean, yeah. I, like, I like what I hear. I think we can use some of that. Um, we just also heard from some of the Dutch consumers, and I don't think it's any different in, in Denmark, but uh, uh, one of the barriers to, to choose organic, it's the pricing. That's what we always hear in all the discussions about organic food. Uh, it's, it's, it's much, uh, it's the price, it's much higher than normal products. How did you go about to, to sort of tackle this problem? Or is it still a big problem in Denmark as well? Or are well, Danish people used to spending more money on food? What, what can no, we learn actually, here? It's the same trend in Denmark where people are spending less and less money on food. Um, that's been going for decades. And uh, that's a real problem. That's problem number one for, for the organic sector is, is the price differential. So we've done many things. Uh, one is actually working in the supply chain to uh, bring more professional businesses into the business to try to keep prices down. We've actually also, in some cases, negotiated with uh, the retail sector where individual, you know, they're, they, they're competing on price. So they're putting prices down, which there's a limit, of course. It does, it's more expensive to produce organic food. Um, so they put prices down. We got them to eat that, uh, the retail sector, rather than passing it on to, to farmers. But and th that way, the prices have been held down. Competition is important. But then we try to tackle this issue of price head on um, to talk about that organics is more for your money. Um, because uh, we also have in Denmark, you know, people are saying, oh, the price, I'm getting less, you know, when I use this money. And um, But talking about it's more for nature. It's more for animal welfare. It's more for... Um, your kids, um, and then also trying to turn that frugal pride, which is this whole idea of, you know, wow, I got three for the price of one and so on, um, on its head and saying we actually get richer by spending more money on food, richer in our biodiversity, richer in uh, our health, and then we actually get poorer when we use less money on food, really trying to tackle that. And we've actually gone head on with, uh, in one case, Aldi, which was always the leader, always kind of setting prices down on, on milk, for example. And then all the others follow afterwards. We did a film where we said, yeah, buy organic milk, but don't buy it in Aldi because cheap milk is expensive for all of us, for our nature, for the farmers, et cetera. And that was the first time in history that the other retail actors didn't follow Aldi and set prices way down. So there's this balance between having prices that are low enough so that they're interesting, but also not so low that you, can, you can't pay the farmers a decent price for their hard work with organic. Yeah. yeah. So changing the narrative, but also really, I think, lobbying uh, towards supermarkets and retail change to work on the pricing. We will talk uh, about this uh, in a couple of minutes, about strategic uh, coalitions, about all the stakeholders you actually need to accomplish uh, this very ambitious goal. Uh, but first, let's see if some ideas came in through our brainstorm. Kevin? Yeah, for sure. It's, wow. going, it's going really well. It's going Screen really is well. full. Yeah, and uh, I think a couple of interesting um, uh, ideas. I think the main important big one is the, the people in the organic sector should work together more. 
and um, a couple of ideas to um, do another consumer campaign and focus on the youth. They're, they're, they're the future. Um, and try and promote organic consumption instead of organic uh, production. But also a lot on the government side, uh, no taxes on organic, we've, we've heard it before, and try to help uh, farmers uh, with a basic income um, who, are, who are organic farmers and involve cities and school, fair pricing uh, was another one. And on retail and business side, it's about supermarkets um, giving, giving organic products a more prominent place in their shelves and, and trying to uh, get the consumers to buy organic products. Okay, thank so you. For now, but keep the ideas coming in. Keep it coming, we can use all of them. Um, so Paul, we talked about consumer trust, some of your campaigning strategies in Denmark. Uh, let's talk about the coalitions you have been building in the last years. Um, you talked about really unifying the organic movement in Denmark. And could you share a little bit about how did you go about, how did you make sure that all kinds of stakeholders were actually on board uh, aiming for the same goal? Yeah, yeah. Well, we had uh, we had eight organizations uh, in Denmark, which uh, in 2002 we merged into uh, one organization, Organic Denmark. So that was huge. Instead of having eight chairmen out talking to the media, we had one. We could organize campaigns, pool our resources, also for marketing, but also a range of uh, political activities and other things. Um, so that was that was huge. Um, we've also used our alliances, political alliances, also in relation to the market. Um, we've done campaigns together with the, uh, the largest nature conservancy organization, the animal welfare organization. We've done a campaign with the consumers organization. So we try to, um, you know, we work for uh, what they're fighting for. And so, and they see that we take seriously their issues. And so we've been able to build those kinds of alliances and a really kind of a positive organizational ecosystem for organics. Um, but one of the most unique features I think in Denmark is the way that we've built partnerships with the retail sector. Um, we started already in the nineties, um, even in the eighties to a slight degree, but going in and working with the individual supermarket chains. We started with co-op. They were the very first um, to really go all in, uh, or not all in, but uh, uh, significantly into organics in the 90s, um, and work with them at a strategic level um, with the individual supermarket chains, placing organics more centrally in their own strategy for very good reasons, because it brings the most interesting people into the store. People are willing to pay for food. Um, it also uh, reflects a lot of the values that today, especially, more and more companies want to be associated with, that they are responsible in relation to people, animals, the planet. Um, so placing it more strategically at the leadership level and then working with them to expand their product assortments, fill all the gaps that they have in their product assortments, pres present the products better in the stores and communicate much better with their customers about the benefits of organic. And then when they have success, then they want more. And the more the individual chains um, go into organics, expand their assortments, market it more heavily, um, and we help them with that, then they're pressing their competitors to do the same. So we've got this kind of positive upward spiral that's going where everyone wants to work with the organic sector because in Denmark, you can't really have uh, a retail chain that doesn't have a serious organic assortment and strategy. Yeah, so Otherwise, you really created competitiveness, yeah. like a competition for all the retailers to yeah. join in and to show actually what they, they can do. Yeah, momentum. Yeah, yeah. And looking back on, because you have been working on the organic movement for quite some years, is there um, any moment you could mention that could be some sort of tipping point when you really saw the organic market growing? Um, was there some sort of tipping moment and what are the accelerators that have been driven this movement? Yeah, well, I think there's, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of particular events that have been important, but more than tipping points, I think we have more of kind of the strategic shifts and actions that have created the constant tipping towards more and more organic sales. We've had increases in organic sales every year since the 90s. And so, so it's been 
but but there are some critical factors: the organic law, the action plans, the um, the establishment of organic Denmark, but also um, things like uh, in 2004 when we went all into the discount sector. It was very controversial. Many producers didn't think organic products belonged in the discount sector, but the effect of that was that. Um, that pressed the rest of the supermarket chains to work even more seriously with organics. Um, but also, uh, when we had the economic downturn in 2008, and all of the future researchers were saying, oh, now we're going to see a fall in organic sales because it's a luxury product, we continued to go forward because we had moved into the discount sector. And when people moved over there, they kept buying organics. Um, and we found out that people under that kind of pressure of economics, they'd start taking some decisions about what's really important to them. And actually the food that they give their kids was really important, so people kept buying more. Um, so that was a kind of a tipping point because there were negative expectations to the organic sector where we were able to, with a massive effort, out working with the, uh, the supermarket chains um, and also talking to the media could show that, no, it's not going that way. It's being more organic when people have less money to spend. So that was uh, some powerful messaging. Yep. And the last one I think is probably the, um, the efforts in the public sector kitchens, um, where I think it's, it's the best case for this kind of um, endangered this simultaneousness in policy on the one hand and a massive mobilization in the organic sector on the other. So on the policy side, we had a goal for 60% organic. We had financing for education in the kitchens and we had an, an organic label, cuisine label for 30, 60 and 90% organic. And then in the sector, we organized a guarantee of supply. So we brought farmers and food companies and food service together to make sure that when the public sector demanded the products, they were there. Um, and then we did organic schools for the food service industry, which was quite traditional at that time. They needed to be motivated. So we had to have this kind of, the sector sort of a motivation machine, um, working with these people who, many of, them, many of these people selling organic, selling products in the food service sector had never bought an organic product in their life. But by getting them out on the farms, they could see, I mean, what this does for nature and animals and other things. And so, they became good salespeople. And the last part, which was the actual education out in the public kitchens with our closest allies, the uh, trade unions representing the people working out in these kitchens, which had been through uh, incredible industrialization. Their, their, their work was not fun anymore. I mean, now they can, instead of opening up freezer bags, they could start making climate friendly, healthier, organic food with less meat, more plant based, less waste. And these are like the champions of uh, a green transition. So we had billboards three stories high celebrating these people out in the public kitchens um, who had driven this green transformation with their craft. Um, so the, we build on pride and we try to celebrate the people because organics is really, whether it's a farmer or in a food company or out in the kitchens, it's, it's, all, about, um, it's all about the people. It's all about their motivations to, yep. to work, on, work for organics. I think you did a really great job and of course the whole team behind Organic Denmark in, like you say, combining uh, you know, actions on the, on the policy side when it comes to rules and regulations, but also really creating this movement uh, and if I, if I hear your stories, you know, make, be, making people proud of what they're actually selling yeah. uh, and making people really an ambassador for the organic movement. So yeah. you did a really great job on, uh, on this point. And we will talk a bit more on the politics and uh, the policy side with our uh, next speaker in a couple of minutes, because um, let's turn to Kevin for a, a check-in on the brainstorming. I hope Paul is inspiring our audience as well to come up with some ideas. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, going, it's going very well. Loads of um, ideas coming in. Um, and I think maybe one of the most important um, votes. We have an election coming up. So people at home, um, vote with your, your conscience and uh, um, make the change. Um, but also a couple of uh, wild ideas. We need a big supermarket to go full organic, to give the right example. And uh, a couple of nice um, examples of campaigns like the Kiel campaign in the USA, but also the avocado show we have in, uh, in Amsterdam and now uh, going, going worldwide, a one product shop um, which tells a story. So I think loads of good uh, ideas coming in. Keep them coming in and 
Our item. Yes. Yes, keep it coming and really great that you're joining from home. So we will talk to Chair de Groot. Welcome. You are here in the studio, Member of Parliament for the Democrats. Um, and like Paul just said, I mean, the policy side of pushing the organic movement further is extremely important. Um, so let's talk a bit about that. Um, you are responsible for food and agriculture in your party. Um, and after hearing the success stories of Paul, uh, I was wondering if we shouldn't choose organic farming, organic consumption as the way forward when it comes to sustainable agriculture. Because I know in the Netherlands there are so many narratives. We have the circular farming, we have the nature inclusive farming. Um, can be a bit confusing also for either both farmers but also for consumers to actually make a sustainable choice. Shouldn't we just go ahead and, and, like Paul did, unify the organic movement and choose organic as the one, one-stop shop, actually? Well, what Paul did is, is really a great job and uh, big compliments to, to Denmark because what, what he did was unifying and, and, and motivate people to, uh, to buy organic and the results are there. So uh, the big lesson from Denmark is that we should have a concerted action in the Netherlands as well. Uh, we have big issues with agriculture in, in the Netherlands, uh, as well as in Denmark, uh, I guess, with uh, nitrogen. So there's a big challenge to uh, increase sustainability of the whole sector. And organic agriculture is a big example of sustainable agriculture. Of course, there are more niches, but it is also good to stay a niche, but a much bigger niche than we have now in the Netherlands. Yeah. So you say there's there's room there's for Absolutely. other forms of uh, farming. So not just the organic farming, but other ways of farming as well. Because in your uh, program, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on the more circular farming, um, and that can be confusing sometimes, maybe for consumers, like the difference between you know, circular farming, organic farming. Circular farming is not labeled, n not labeled yet, maybe. What is your view on this? Well, um, the organic farming is it's much more further ahead in, 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 in marketing, in production, in standards. Circular agriculture is a way to put new, uh, a, a new standard for conventional agriculture. And that has to do with an efficient uh, use of the uh, arable land on, on Earth. If we, with the current system, we need three uh, earth uh, to, to feed the growing population. So we need to increase efficiency. Uh, don't give, uh, for example, with four principles. The first principle is a big principle, not to give uh, food to uh, animals which uh, uh, people also can eat. Yep. Uh, which is a big importance. So also no, no maize to chickens or to, uh, to pigs, for example. Uh, the second thing is to use biology and uh, organic farming is a big example here. We have a, uh, a lot of chemical inputs, but we need more uh, use the biology. Also conventional agriculture. Um, and the third uh, is, is, uh, is important to, to change um, the way we look um, at, um, at animal welfare, of course, because Animal welfare is also for conventional agriculture uh, very problematic. And also there, organic farming is a big example. Yep. Uh, that the animals should see, be able to see the sky. Uh, it was really nice uh, uh, to hear that from, from Denmark. So there's a lot more to do than for conventional agriculture. Uh, so that's the reason we say as D66, the, the, our, my party, to uh, focus on the transition of conventional uh, agriculture, yep. but uh, organic uh, farming should grow and can grow as well. Yeah, and what are some of your ideas to uh, also to support Dutch consumers to make organic choices? We just heard some consumers and their barriers and also their motivations to buy organic food. What are some of your ideas to really promote organic eating? Well, um, First, it's most obvious to use the common agriculture policy to, to support uh, supply of uh, organic farmers, to change uh, 
uh, the, the, the two years of uh, bridging to uh, when you switch to organic farming. The second is that uh, governments uh, are a big buyer of organic, can yeah. be a big buyer of organic. Uh, the public kitchens the in public Denmark. The public kitchens, yeah. big example. We should do that uh, as well in the Netherlands. And the third is the leading role of retail. Uh, we heard this from Paul as well. In the Dutch retail, it's only about price, price, and price. And farmers should get a fair price. And there's no transparency on their uh, sustainable um, uh, buying, uh, including a fair price. So I, uh, my party introduced uh, a proposition to increase standards on reporting and transparency. Uh, because now supermarkets tend to um, report on uh, some little niches, some nice products, and say, we are sustainable. But they're not sustainable at all. The yep. biggest part of the assortment is not sustainable. Now in the Netherlands, due to the nitrogen problematic, we have to restore nature for 6 billion euros in the coming 10 years. This are part of the food price should have been a part of the food price, yep. not to intensify normal agriculture too much. Yeah. And looking at the, the goal, we heard it many times already during this session, the 25% market share in 2030, it's quite ambitious. Um, is it something you embrace uh, with your, uh, your own party, this goal? But also, do you think there are strategic allies? We have the elections coming up, of course, in, in two, minute, uh, two months' time. Um, do you see any possibilities for strategic alliances to really push this goal forward? Or are you the only one? Well, there are definitely more parties. Um, uh, D66 is really embracing this, uh, this, this goal, which is also a part of the uh, European Green Deal. Um, I'm afraid that um, uh, parties like the, uh, the Liberal Party, the VVD and, and CDA, the Christians, are more conservative on this, um, uh, in this matter. So it will be very difficult to uh, put this on the agenda. So what is needed is really this concerted effort from the sector itself to put it on the agenda and to make it also um, uh, 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 for... Uh, interesting for politicians to embrace it, that also politicians are becoming proud on promoting uh, biological agriculture. Yep. Because now there's a much backfire for conventional politicians um, when they promote uh, organic farming. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to switch to Paul for some remarks uh, uh, on the more the political side, because I know that in Denmark uh, you were able to create this strategic alliance. There were, I think, nine political parties that underpinned the, this goal uh, of the 25% market share, if I'm right. Can you share a little bit on how sort of the political uh, side worked in Denmark? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have uh, we have a goal of uh, that's about the same as the the new EU goal, um, and we have political support in varying degrees from ten out of eleven of the political parties in the parliament, and this came about through intensive dialogue uh, with all of these parties, and always by talking to all of the parties, not just one, not just two, not just the ones in government, but all the political parties, on the basis of what's important to them. They all have goals, and for some of these parties, they support organic because it's green growth or it's new opportunities for farmers. Others, it's the environment. For others, it's animal welfare. But we try to take start with where they are and how we can help them achieve their goals. And so when we've had changes in governments and so on, we've actually uh, weathered this pretty well because we've always had uh, friendly uh, parties their focus politically and, and on policy issues is different, but it's still been fairly consistent. Um, in terms of goals, our, our motto has always been goals are good, action is better. Um, but I will say that goals are, they send a powerful signal to farmers. They send a powerful signal to consumers and to cities uh, also about um, organics as part of the solution to a whole range of, our, of challenges. Um, and then goals, at some point, you have to find out whether you've reached them or not. So they are a motivation for investment and for actually action. Um, 
So, I mean, with this kind of approach, we've had a fairly, fairly broad support. And one critical, unusual thing in Denmark when I look around Europe is that the degree to which we've integrated organic policy into the broad policy agendas. So when we've made new biodiversity policies and agricultural policies and green growth and export, we always get organics built in because it's a very useful tool for solving some of these problems and achieving some of these opportunities. So uh, that's that's also been very, uh, very important. And the other thing you, you mentioned, the, the conventional uh, uh, farmers or politicians reacting to organics um, as an attack on on conventional farming, maybe and we've always tried to avoid that because um, so we don't talk about conventional farming. We don't talk about that. We we try to build support for building up the organic sector because it has all of these benefits. Um, and so if we forced politicians to choose between conventional and organic, we would lose. So there's also kind of a pragmatic reason not to take this approach, but it's also for us, it's less motivating to be talking about it. And our farmers, frankly, they don't want us to be attacking conventional farmers because they would rather play cards with their neighbors than talk about what their organizations have said about each other. So, so it's that way, just kind of building up on a positive agenda really does work. Yeah, building bridges. And I think we, well, we still have a lot of work to do in the coming months uh, because, well, the elections are coming up and the formation, of course, is, is coming up. Um, I'd like to check in one more time at the brainstorm and uh, before I do poll, I want to give you some time uh, to think about some concluding remarks uh, before we end uh, this session. <laughs> and maybe you can think of your one or two top prior advices you can bring to the table uh, and advise us here in the Netherlands on how to push the market share further um, on organic foods. Um, and for you, Chaird, as well, some minutes to think about it. Um, you know, what for you is the priority uh, when reaching the goal of the 25% market share of organic foods? First, I want to hear, are you optimistic about this goal, but also how can we reach, reach it? What are your thoughts about it? But first, let's check in with Kevin and see the ideas you came up with from home. Yes, thanks, Helen. Um, I think uh, Paul has great actions, goals, and um, what comes back in the brainstorm is policy. Um, loads of comments on the government should be the good example, and uh, not only the government, but healthcare should be leading. Um, maybe even a minister of food. I don't know, Chirt. Very good idea. <laughs> Very minister good of idea. food. Um, example from Paul celebrate the people working in organic, and also. Um, Look at the different uh, target groups. Um, we want to show the added value of organic. And let's have a look. Um, yeah, we have to we have to build a bridge. Or I think it's more closing closing the gap between the cities and urban agriculture. We have to, for an example, uh, get people uh, to visit to visit the farms and see what happens, and see what makes the difference. Um, and I think what it came back a couple of times. Um, Vote. This is the <laughs> chance to vote. Well, that's a really great advice. Yeah. So go vote in March. Uh, Paul, I'd like yeah. to give you the floor for some concluding remarks that yeah. you want to bring in. Yeah. Uh, well, um, two things. One on the on the on the big scale. I mean, we need some. We do need some game changers. So we're going to see significant advances uh, like a doubling or doubling again of organic and that's that's things like using the opportunities um, from the EU now that we can redirect funding to farming from area support to supporting climate actions and biodiversity actions out on the farm that will change farming and it will also uh, help to create a more level playing field for the farmers who are actually doing these things. So it's not just a cost for them, but they're actually uh, being paid for it. And um, then I think we do need more green fees, carbon taxes um, that will again, level the playing field between farms that have higher emissions and farms that, uh, that don't. And then in terms of uh, closer to home, uh, I would say, my advice would be, uh, I know there has been organic policy in the Netherlands. I know there are solid organizations. There's a, a Bionext and then there's organizations for the producers, etc. I would say develop together closely with the organic sector, a broad, well-financed, 
multi-year organic policy package um, that develops organic farming in the market. And as part of that, one of our lessons is invest in capacity building in those organic organizations because they can really drive market development and they can also change the way farmers think and act so that they contribute more to a sustainable uh, transformation out on the farm. So that would be my, my parting words. Thank you. I wrote it all down, so we <laughs> will make it work. Thank you, Paul. Maybe some reaction from Cheert and then also your priorities for the upcoming months, years? Yeah, very good ideas. And thank you for, uh, for these ideas, uh, uh, Paul. I'm, I'm optimistic. Um, we have had two crises in the last four years. The one is the nitrogen crisis, which is basically a health crisis of our nature. And the other is uh, the corona crisis, of course, which is also basically a health crisis. So let's use the coming two months to put this on the agenda, to tell the story about health. That if you have a good health, you're more able to survive uh, critical viruses like corona. If your nature is in good health, then you're able to survive uh, as, as a country as, uh, and, and for your children. So this richness, we should uh, develop uh, a narrative uh, which makes it sexy for all politicians to, um, to be for organic, to promote uh, sustainable agriculture in which form uh, uh, there is, so that we are able to uh, motify retailers to show leadership, to show leadership that they are responsible for this planet, uh, responsible for our health, so that they can change the market. They are the parties who have contact with consumers, who can influence cons uh, consumers. So, and uh, I want to challenge the Bionext uh, to, to come up with ideas for this concerted action, for this big marketing ideas. There has been a decision that there will be a Landbau Accord, a, a big agriculture um, agreement. Uh, agreement in the Netherlands. So be there and uh, as a biological sector and uh, be heard. Uh, I will be your ambassador uh, in Parliament, but uh, there's a lot uh, uh, needed to, uh, to go forward. Yes. Thank you so much, Shared, and a lot of success in the coming two months with the campaigning and with the elections. And thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Thank you, Paul, also from Denmark. Thank you for your input. Thank you for your advice. Hopefully we can stay in touch and build the organic movement stronger, both in Denmark and in the Netherlands. So thank you so much for your participation. Thank you. And thank you to all the people at home for participating in this session. You can see this session online. It will be available also after today. If you heard some great uh, stories or some great inspiration, some strategies you want to use, you can, uh, well, look the show back uh, in a couple of days. Uh, I think we heard some great advices for our organic movement here in the Netherlands. Hopefully we can work together, uh, make them possible. We can work on the capacity building. I think, well, the political engagement has been mentioned, very important, uh, and build this sector stronger in the coming years. Thank you for watching and have a great evening. Goodbye. <laughs>